How is the exergonic electron transport system pathway actually linked to ATP synthesis, to oxidative phosphorylation? The first clues came from the effects of a respiratory poison called dinitrophenol, or DNP. Mitochondrial isolates could oxidize NADH or FADH2, consume oxygen, and make ATP, as suggested here. Mitochondria treated with dinitrophenol, while still able to oxidize the reduced electron carriers and consume oxygen, would not make ATP. Investigators concluded that the DNP uncoupled electron transport from ATP synthesis. In other words, the two processes were coupled, but were actually independent processes. In what was a curious observation, DNP-treated mitochondria were able to hydrolyze added ATP. Curious because normal untreated mitochondrial isolates never exhibited an ATPase activity, an activity that would hydrolyze ATP. If a chemical, dinitrophenol, could stop ATP synthesis but leave the electron transport system intact, then it should be possible to physically separate the electron transport system from oxidative phosphorylation reactions. Ephraim Racker was experimenting with ways to dissect mitochondria and analyze the functions of the parts. This slide is a representation of the crystal membrane from electron micrographs, which suggested that the inner surface of the crystal membrane was coated with particles. The separation of the parts took Racker a long time to solve, but eventually his mitochondrial dissection was successful. So here's the dissection. Purified mitochondria were subjected to high-frequency sound waves, ultrasound. In the electron microscope, Racker and company saw fragments of membrane and membrane vesicles coated with stalked particles when provided oxygen, ADP, inorganic phosphate, or PI, and a reduced electron carrier, for example NADH, these broken mitochondrial bits were able to oxidize NADH, consumed oxygen in the process, and made ATP, just like intact mitochondria. Also, just like intact mitochondria, if dinitrophenol were added to the busted up mitochondria, they would continue electron transport in the presence of DNP, but could not make ATP. Far from it, the vesicles would hydrolyze ATP. The stock particles were then isolated by centrifugation and further dissected. An electron micrograph shown at the right shows the particles after this isolation. The supernatant from the centrifugation, containing mostly loose membrane bits, could not oxidize NADH or make ATP or do any of the things that mitochondria can do or that the original preparation can do. But the isolated stalked particles had all of the properties of intact mitochondria. They could conduct electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation, and upon adding dinitrophenol, these stock particle isolates would do electron transport, but would make no ATP. And if you added ATP to dinitrophenol-treated particles, the ATP would be hydrolyzed. From his experiments, Racker concluded that the stock particle was a crystal membrane fraction that had closed up inside out after isolation, and that the particles that coated the crystal membranes, these lollipops, were the same as seen in the electron micrograph in the previous slide. Because it had all of the respiratory activities of intact mitochondria, these lollipop-studded vesicles were indeed a model for studying mitochondrial respiration. Finally, Racker's lab was able to dislodge these lollipop particles from the membranes by shaking them in a high salt concentration solution. The remaining smooth vesicles moved to the bottom of a centrifuge during a spin, while the stock particles remained suspended. A single stock particle can be seen in the electron micrograph on the right in this slide. Fraction 2, F2, the smooth vesicle in the pellet, would conduct electron transport, but could not make ATP. Fraction 1, the isolated stock particle, would not do electron transport, and of course would not do ATP synthesis. But if ATP were added to this fraction 1, the ATP would be hydrolyzed, leading Racker and company to call this fraction 1 an ATPase. So electron transport can be physically uncoupled from what is likely to be oxidative phosphorylation. Racker concluded that it was the F2 vesicle fraction that contained the electron transport bits, and then correctly surmised that the F1 ATPase lollipop particle was really an ATP synthase, but only when coupled to the electron transport system. And here's the conclusion. F2 has the ET parts, but no ATP synthase, and the F1 is really an ATP synthase. To make sure that the activities, or lack thereof, that Racker saw in the fractionated mitochondria were real, and not just some artifact of the mitochondrial isolation process, he tried to put the parts back together. 
He succeeded in reconstituting what sure looked like stalked vesicles in the electron microscope, complete with the activities shown here, including a recoupling of the electron transport system and oxidative phosphorylation, that is the ability to make ATP while oxidizing NADH or FADH2, thereby regaining that ATP synthase activity. And, of course, the reconstituted vesicle behaved just like the original studded vesicle. In the presence of DNP and ATP, the ATP would be hydrolyzed. In the presence of DNP and NADH and oxygen, there would be electron transport. But even if ADP and inorganic phosphate were also added, no ATP would be made. That is, there would be no oxidative phosphorylation. These reconstitution experiments confirm that the components were not altered or inactivated by this mitochondrial dissection. I just want to point out that the idea of pulling apart organelles and subcellular particles and then putting them back together or reconstituting them is a recurring theme in cell and molecular biology studies.